Okay. Maybe we need to go through a little review on that. Uh, problem 67. The Weibull distribution, find the density function. Okay. Show that if it follows an x, show that if w follows a Weibull distribution, then x equals w over f follows an exponential distribution. I was missing the lambda for some reason. So what's the lambda in that situation? Mm -hmm. Okay, how would you, let's show the distribution function method. Um, one way is to show, the, uh, is to establish the density, but the basic way in which you establish the density of a transformation of a random variable is to use the distribution function, the cumulative distribution function. So what's the uh, cumulative distribution function method or the distribution function method? Let's take in this problem uh, chapter 2.67, part um, uh, B, you have um, x equals w over alpha to the beta, where alpha is greater than 0 and beta is greater than 0, right? By given constants. So let's look at the cumulative distribution function of x. We know the cumulative distribution function of w. So I want to calculate the cumulative distribution function of x and show that it is exponential, uh, an exponential cumulative distribution function. So f of x is the probability that capital X is less than little x. So I'm going to fix little x. Okay. For each fixed little x, I'm going to do a calculation of the probability. Right? Now I'm just going to plug in the definition of capital X. It's the probability that capital W over alpha to the beta is less than or equal to little x. Okay. Now, what can I do with that? How can I get the W only on one side of that? Okay. Here's the thing. And here's what I'm going to use. Suppose let, so use the following fact. Use fact that if g of, uh, uh, maybe I'll call this x naught in order to, fix, to uh, not confuse you, I'm going to fix that x naught, really fix it, okay, so when I really want to fix x, I put a naught on it, okay, indicate that, and plus I want to use the variable x in a different, if, if x equals g of w, because I want to use my x here, is, um, Increasing. Okay. An increasing function on the line. So, therefore, I can have a picture like this. Here's W, here's X, and I have some function like this. And it's just going up like that. Okay. If that's increasing, then the set of all W. Such that g of w is less than or equal to x naught, let's say, okay, is equal to the set of all w such that w is less than or equal to g inverse of x naught. Okay? In other words, if you have an increasing function, then I can take the inverse function of both sides of the inequality, preserve the inequality. Let's just check that. Here is x naught here. And here's W, and I'm just basically saying, if I'm if I'm looking at the set of all W such that um, G of W is less than X naught, that's all the W to the left of this point here, right? Which means I just take my X naught and I go backwards, and that's my G inverse of X naught right here. Okay, that's what the W is. So that's my W naught equals G inverse of X naught equals the set of I E set of all w, this that w is less than the w naught. Okay. What this amounts to, in other words, is I can take the betas from the both sides, multiply both sides by alpha, and get the same probability. Okay? 
you don't, you're not, you would have followed that, but here we're making a general discussion about it. Okay, so this is the probability <laughs> that uh, W over alpha must be with x naught to the 1 over beta, which is the same thing as the probability that W is less than alpha x naught to the 1 over beta. Okay. Okay. And I'm just saying, as long as I have what I'm, what I'm basically saying is if I have an increasing function, then I can do that. Some examples of exponential powers like this, the logarithm is increasing. You know, it, if it's decreasing, then I have to switch the quality. But when the CDF... If it's increasing and decreasing, then all bets are off, then you got to do something else. Go ahead. If we're talking about the CDF, isn't it always increasing? Uh, that's an increasing function, but this function here, the transformation, see I'm making x is some trans transformation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it increasing? Actually, it's not increasing if w could be negative, right? Because the square power is not an increasing function, right? So you have to be a little bit careful. This function, this w, though, is positive, okay? Because it was a y random variable, it was a positive random variable, so w is greater than 0 in, in part a. So f of x is uh, this function. In other words, uh, you have a non-negative random variable. You really should have said it, f of f. Okay, my y variable is not negative. They're switching the x's and the w's later, too, because they're reusing x. They put f of x for familiarity, right? In the first, but actually the random variable is w. You should have said f of w is uh, 1 minus, uh, e minus w over alpha and beta. <coughs> They said? Yeah. Okay. For x and for w greater than zero. Little w greater than zero. Okay, that's my distribution. That's my double, that's my distribution function of the Bible. Okay? So I'll just call that g of w. Okay? Okay. That's my distribution function of the Bible. So the Weibull random variable is non-negative. Non-negative random variable, and therefore, this is an increasing function. Okay. So the beta power doesn't make sense anyway unless you have a positive number of betas. Real. Okay. So, so just a general real. So, anyways, here w is positive. So this is a good function to work with. But if in general if I have a square, then I can't solve this inequality this way. I have to say minus is, you know. I have to take the square root and I have to put a minus the square root to double inequality. You see, that's what they you know, do, in fact, in a different example. Um, C, example C on page 61, they do that. They actually take the square power, the square power of a standard normal, where a standard normal is positive and negative. Page 61. They actually take. Uh, x equals z squared, and they have to sell the uh, inequality x plus or equal to little x. Okay? So there, you don't just simply... So all I'm going to do is the technicality here. But I solve this. Now well, how do I do this? Well, how do I calculate? Well, this is just capital G of this, this little w. This is my little w, w naught now, right? My w naught. So this is simply capital G of W naught. And I just plug it in there. Okay. And I get 1 minus e to the minus x naught. Right? No, it just cancels out. Okay. And I get this. So now that is the um, distribution function of exponential with parameter 1. Okay. So we just say lambda is equal to 1. Right. Well, you do find lambda is equal to 1 in this case. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, you have to be a little bit, here you have to be a little bit fluid with, you know, they're changing the x's on you and stuff. They have to, uh, <laughs> it's natural, if it's calling the, the Weibull variable w, then you go back and you have to call your distribution function in terms of w. 
that was the key um, to that to help you keep your variables together. A little fluidity in the variable assignment. Okay. Uh, how would you generate that? Generate a y bar. Since you know about this is exponential, um, how would I generate an exponential? If I could generate an exponential, then I presume I could generate the y bar by taking the beta root and multiplying by alpha, right? So in other words, I can stop the w in terms of x. So the question is, how do I generate x? How do I generate an exponential? Parameter one. Okay, they have an example in the text about that, so I'm kind of back because they didn't cover this yet. Um, example E on page 63. So let me show you how you generate. Uh, let's show you just basically the quantile transform is simple enough. How do I generate a random variable with a given distribution G? is you have your cumulative distribution function. This is a CDF. When I say distribution, it's a cumulative distribution function. Um, a, distribution fun what, a distribution function, so between 0 and 1 is non-decreasing and all that good stuff. Uh, so here's your, here's your distribution function. It's 1 here, 0 down here. Here's G of No 
somebody's listening to zero, so I'll have to change this picture. Okay. Okay. But anyway, um, in that example, okay. So there's a certain percent of people less than less than the age of 50. Okay. And that's given on the vertical axis. The percentage of the probabilities on the vertical axis this is the probability up here. Okay. As a cumulative distribution function, I said, well, now obviously, uh, you know, if you increase the age, then more higher, higher percentage of people get underneath that bar. Okay? Okay? So it's just. So then x.9 is the, is the age, assuming there's a continuous variable, which uh, so we can exactly get 90% of people less than to that age. Uh, you have a nice continuous curve here. Point 0.9 quantile, x sub point 0.9 is a notation for it, x sub point 0.90 if you like that better, okay? x sub point 0.90 or the 90th percentile. Okay. Everybody's familiar with that concept, I believe, at this point. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just consider um, the quantile transform is this. I'm just going to um, um, take, uh, I'm going to look at u equals g inverse of x, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider that um, So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the following um, random variable. I'm going to take let u equal a uniform random variable and variable. I'm going to mess this up. Okay. And then I'm going to take um, so capital G inverse. We're assuming this is strictly increasing, so the capital G inverse makes sense, and the author makes some definition. Here, the, the, the distribution function be strictly increasing on a certain interval. Okay, in fact, the whole real line is a possibility. And zero to the left of that interval, and one to the right of that interval. Okay. Uh, well, here I can take the whole half infinite line, and then this distribution function would satisfy that condition. So there's intervals here from zero to infinity. I have a function strictly increasing on an interval, and Zero to the left of that interval and one to the right of the interval. Well, there's no right to the interval, so that's okay. So, I, so in other words, g inverse exists. Now I'm going to take x equals g inverse of u. Okay? U is a uniform random variable. Now I claim that x has distribution capital G. The distribution function of x is capital G. Why is that? Why should it be? <clears throat> well, because what does this do? You see, if I take a little u, little u is the uh, youth quantile of a standard normal, I saw of a uniform variable. Because little u equals the youth quantile of uniform, 0, 1. Okay, that's trivial, right? If I want the youth quantile of a uniform random variable, I just take u is the answer. Okay? Because uh, the distribution function is just f of u equals u. Straight line. Okay? So that's the youth quantile. So if I want to get, so I want to, but now I want to transform that uh, into the youth quantile of the distribution g. So in other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, points uniformly distributed uh, between 0 and 1 here. And I'm going to transform them back to the x-axis, and that's going to be a random variable. Okay? So you think of points being picked at random here. Okay. And now I'm going to take um, any such point, I'm going to transform back to the x-axis by this, by this reverse direction, g inverse, right? 
this way. So it should be have the property that, okay, uh, if I want to have distribution um, G on this axis, you know, I want to have points now. They're not going to be, you know, equally distributed along this axis. I mean, they all have a whole different line anyway. Okay. So how could it be that I'll get exactly the distribution G? Okay. Well, uh, it sort of makes sense that I should take uh, the youth quantile here and turn it into the youth quantile over there. Okay. So that, whatever that point is, when I transform it over here, nine percent. If, if this was a, a point nine quantile, all right, then nine percent of the points should be equal to the rear of it. Okay, and that should be true for each U. So this is how you can explain it. So <laughs> G inverse. So uh, X equals G inverse of U equals the U quantile of capital G. So that's that's the explanation. Okay, in terms of these pictures. Okay. Uh, and then actually, how do you write it? So let's write it down formally. Let's use the distribution function method and show actually proof proposition D that this distribution function capital X is in fact G, capital G. So we take capital F of X equals the probability that capital X proof of proposition D that, uh, well, I didn't state proposition D, but proposition D is that this random variable has a distribution capital G. as CDF capital G of X. Okay? That's the state. Proposition B. So let's check it. Probably capital X is less than little x. That will be then the probability that capital G inverse of capital U is less than or equal to uh, little x, which is the probability the cap because G inverse is increasing as well. I this it versus G. I just apply G to both sides. G is in here. And uh, I get that this is a capital U plus equal to capital G of X. But U is uniformly distributed, so the probability that capital U is less than a fixed number is just that number. If I pick a number random in the unit interval, and the probability that's less than that number, G of X is just G of X. Give me capital F of X is G of X, which is what I want. Distribution of capital X is G. Capital G is what I gave you. So I can generate now, uh, as long as I can generate a uniform random variable, I can generate any other random variable with distribution G as long as I can find G inverse. So that's the practicality of the proposition. Use the quantile transform. In other words, capital G inverse of a uniform variable. And so that's what I'll do. In order to get an exponential, therefore, this is uh, example E on page 63. I will take the uh, cumulative distribution function of the exponential with parameter lambda and invert it. So, example E, page 63. Uh, find the quantile transform for the exponential distribution with parameter lambda. All I have to do, I'm now going to call it capital F now instead of capital G. Hopefully, you, because that's how it will be applied most often. All right, so now I'll replace capital G by capital F, because that's the distribution I want to uh, make. Okay, and uh, I'll, well, I'll bring this problem back. Well, this is important. Okay, we'll come back to problem 67. So now, uh, if I want to make uh, exponential variables, and I have capital F of, for the exponential distribution of parameter lambda, so F of X is 1 minus e to the minus lambda x, x greater than or equal to zero. Right? That's the cumulative distribution function of the exponential 
density. I don't think I did that last. Did I get into the exponential last time? I think I didn't get to it. It's on page 50. <laughs> You've seen it before, probably, though. Everything's going to be boiled back to can I construct a uniform random variable? How would I construct a uniform random variable? <laughs> That's another issue. It's actually a different course. <laughs> how to actually, or another topic anyway, how to construct a good uh, pseudo random sequence. You need to pick numbers of random and you know, somehow. I could do it with a device, you know, a mechanical device, or I could try to do some kind of computer program algorithm to try to generate numbers and somehow it looked as though there are a sequence of random numbers in the interval. That's what's done. There's an exercise at the end of the chapter sort of discussing how this might be done. So we'll assume that we can come up with some kind of pseudo-random sequences of uh, numbers uniformly distributed in the interval. And then we'll plug them here into the capital U and, and chunk out the capital X. Right? So then I'll get exponentially distributed numbers on the half line. Does this make sense? Because log one u is between zero and one, so one minus u is between zero and one. The log is therefore negative. Therefore to get a positive number I get a minus sign. So this does make sense. You can actually sense 1 minus u has the same distribution as capital U. You can actually you replace the 1 minus u by a capital U there as well. So sometimes you see that formula in the book. Okay, the author doesn't try to mess you up with that. <laughs> okay. 1 minus capital U and capital U would have the same big distribution, right? Alright. So that's how you would get the exponential. Then how would you get the y bolt? You'd have x equals w over alpha to the beta, so then you just solve for this, and then you would get my w equals x to the, what did I say, alpha times x to the 1 over beta. And so you would first get your exponential, and then you uh, do that to it, and you get your y bolt. That's easy. Okay. So you just plug that into the first? Yeah, I just plug this into there. That's the application of this method. This 
see. Maybe we should backtrack a little bit and talk about exponential and, and, uh, and um, density. This last page of these notes here. Can you go back your homework? Yes. Yeah, oh, you want to hand in your homework? It's not due today, actually. There's no I made a change last time that I think it's August 31st, but it's good that you get it done now because uh, there's only a little bit of time to ask about the next homework. So next time you should be asking about chapter 3. I'll try to get into that in just a moment. Um, let's see. Maybe we should cover the uh, exponential and gamma densities just a little bit. Um, We've all seen the exponential density. Uh, maybe I should mention the gamma density. The exponential is a special case of the gamma. So maybe I'll just I'll come up with something. Okay. So let's talk about the gamma density just a little bit because it's going to be in your reading. Sometimes the survival, okay, if, if X represents a lifetime, which is often what we talk about, a waiting time till death or a lifetime, then that's often what the exponential distribution is used as. Is to talk about that. Since it's not negative, it makes sense to a lifetime. And so, If X is a lifetime, 
that it makes sense to talk about the following probability. And actually, this this then has this probably the x bigger than x is in some sense more natural than probably x less than equal to x. This is the probability. This is a survival probability because. This is the percentage of people that live to time x. Okay? <laughs> because the death time is later than x, the waiting time to die. Okay? <laughs> Sounds kind of morbid. But, <laughs> but this is. Uh, this is. Um, survival probability, okay? So this is the, the percentage of. Percentage of, percentage of item percentage of population that survives to time x. And so often an exponential random variable isn't denoted by x, it's denoted by capital T. In fact, the author does make that switch sort of in mid-paragraph. He's talking about a capital T instead of a capital X because he's thinking about time. All right? Make sense? And so that's just e to the minus lambda x. So that's the easy one to remember. Of course, if you remember that one, then you remember the other one. e to the minus lambda x. So that's a very simple thing. That goes to zero. All you need, this, this is probably x bigger than x has to go to zero. Because x goes to infinity. Uh, and so if you have that, now what the membranous property falls out of this easily. So if we now let call call it use so I'll follow the author use t now in place of x. Okay. We call the memory with capital T for time. Alright. And then what we're gonna do is we calculate the probability that um, percentage of the population that survives time t plus s among the, the subpopulation that has survived time s. Okay? That's the, um, let's see, think about, I always use this analogy, Aaron Pope remembers this from last semester, I take a whole bunch of light bulbs in a warehouse And let's say they're extra, you know, there's just zillions of them, okay? So it's an essentially infinite population. And let's say they have an exponentially distributed lifetime, okay? So after a while, you know, certain of them are burned out. And certain of them are not, okay? They're the ones that just, let's say they all just turn out at time zero, okay? And then they just burn out as they burn out, okay? So these, this, this is a subpopulation of bulbs that are still lit at time s. And this, this event describes that. The set of uh, uh, bulbs that whose lifetimes are bigger than s, so they're still burning. So those are the ones that are all turned out still. And this this condition probability is a percentage among that group, okay, that are still lit at time t plus s in the original time unit. So t time t time units later, okay. So what is that? That's conditional probability. Oh. Conditional probability. So that means I'm only going to consider the percentage of, of these. These are yes. I'm not going to take the percentage of the original population. This is the unconditional probability. This is the unconditional probability. Okay? That's the ones that have survived to time t plus s, the ones mm -hmm. that are still burning time t plus s. Alright, that's a small number, but it presumably is. Not quite as small as this, okay? But the claim now is that this is simply equal to the original fraction. So let's calculate this. This is probability capital T is bigger than T plus S. Divide by the probability capital T is bigger than S. Right. And that's just by the uh, survival probability, that's e to the minus lambda T plus S divided by e to the minus lambda S, which is e to the minus lambda T which is simply the probability that capital T is bigger than little t. Right. So 
so this is the Montgomery's property somehow. Um, the ones that are living, the ones that have died, lived to time S, don't remember they've been burn, burning for a long time already. Okay? The rate at which they're going to die is the same as the original rate. For every T bigger than that. For every C bigger than zero, all right, the percentage that have going to die off among them is just the same. It's just the same rate of dying as the original population. So somehow the population doesn't know that it's aged. Uh, this can actually be written out even uh, better in terms of the hazard rate. Uh, sort of tells you the instantaneous rate at which things are changing in time t. So what you can do is you can calculate the, the hazard rate, age of t, which the author does not bring in, the hazard rate to describe this um, problem is consider h of t equals 1 over dt, the probability that you uh, die in the interval t to t plus dt, given that you live to time t. Okay, what's the probability that you're going to rate which the population is dying off? Right? At time t, the ones you got the ones that are living, all right. And now what's the? And then I'm going to say, well, how fast are they? There's a certain percentage they're going to die in interval t to t plus dt right away, okay? And uh, we're going to divide by dt in order to take away the to take away the infinitesimal there. So I just want to know, well, is that is that rate changing? That's called the hazard rate. And if it's going up, as t goes up, that means that the population should remember that it's living and I'm just going to start dying faster. You know, it's like, it's like uh, the rate of depreciation, right? This is the rate of depreciation. Uh, hey, you're 100 years old, now you should really depreciate fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the house should crumble. Okay. <laughs> but maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> maybe you should appreciate fast. Okay. But... <laughs> So um, here, though, this is the, what is this for this particular problem? This is, um, according to, let's see, what is this? This is, how will we calculate this? This is um, the probability that capital T belongs to T to T plus DT, divided by the probability that capital T is bigger than T, and then I want to by that, because I take the intersection of those two events. But this event is bigger. Okay. Uh, this event implies that, of course, you're bigger than T. Okay. Because you're already above T. T. DT is positive here. Okay, we're assuming that DT is positive. And, and infinitesimal. Okay? I'm not going to take limits. I'm not going to do delta T. Delta T goes to zero. I'm just going to put DT. Okay? And let's see, what would this be? This, according to the, um, the numerator, is the definition of the density times dt. That's how we interpret the density. Density is, is density times dt is probability. So this is, this is uh, the numerator is lambda e to the minus lambda t dt. And the bottom is e to the minus lambda t. That's the y of the And by 1 over dt here, OK? So I'll cancel these dt's, and I simply get lambda. So here, the exponential distribution has a property that is hazard rate is constant. Okay, we can do for the Weibull. What's the Weibull? Let's do the Weibull. Compare with Weibull, which is also models. Uh, um, Survival times or lifetimes. Okay, lifetimes. Uh, then you have uh, capital F of, of t is one minus e to the minus. What do we have? T over alpha to the beta, or something like that. So that means the survival time is uh, survival probability capital probability capital T is bigger than t equals e to the this this expression instead of e to the minus lambda t. Of, uh, I have this other junk in here. Okay. Isn't that how we did it in your problem? 67? Put an alpha and a beta or something? Something like that.
that's just another example of uh, yeah of a lifetime distribution function. Okay, and so what would be this has a written on in this case? H of t comes out to be let's see one over dt. I put in the the density. You're just going to do the same calculation. What's the density of this? Well, you have to calculate the depth of your home, right? <laughs> What's the density of this one? The density of the y will uh, come out to be, let's say, a, a beta. I'm going to do the whole problem now. e to the minus t over alpha to the beta. And then there's um, a t to the beta minus 1. And there's some alpha stuff, right? Alpha to the beta. Alpha to the beta. Alpha to the beta. OK. And then I put my dt in, because that's exactly what I did here. And then I have divided by e to the minus t over alpha to the beta in the same calculation. Okay? So the dt is go away. Basically, I'm just getting the density, in other words. Okay? The density is divided by the survival probability. That's all I have here. So it's f of t divided by survival probability. That's what this has for motivated this way, but that's what it boils down to. This comes out to be f of t divided by the probability that t is bigger than t. Right. So when that comes down, then these cancel out, and you get um, some, you just get this, this power expression, beta, t to the beta minus 1 over alpha to the beta. So now if beta is bigger than 1, the hazard rate is going up. If beta is less than 1, the hazard rate is going down. Okay, and beta is equal to 1, it's the memoryless case. Hazard rate is constant. That's the exponential. So if it dies faster, if it's lives longer, it dies slower, if it lives longer, if beta is less than 1. Okay, so it has all those behaviors. And when beta equals 1, it's just this exponential. So that generalizes exponential. All right, that's the exponential density. Probably not in this book, it tends to be more engineering style books. You'll find it. This is more of a statistics oriented book. Gamma density, so you didn't, even though that's a very nice little application, I'll take you right here. The gamma density, uh, this is another one. <laughs> it's another continuous density. Uh, reason going to come in just a little bit because of later chapter. G of t equals lambda to the alpha over gamma of alpha t to the alpha minus 1 e to the minus lambda t. It's going to come in a little bit when we start in, in, in the second half of the course. Um, because it's one of these densities that the moment generating function technique is going to apply to. This is for t greater than or equal to 0. So you're just going to go ahead and keep it as a time t here. All right. Uh, what is all this stuff? What's the gamma? And what is all this? Let's to make a change of variables. Um, this, okay, and so let's do the integral. Integral g of t dt, 0 to infinity, equals to what? If and only if. Let's, let's go ahead and change variables in here. Um, so lambda is like the exponential parameter, but now it's got, instead of, uh, until it's e to the minus lambda t, but instead of lambda to the 1 here, it's lambda to the alpha. Right? And then there's some prefactor t to the power here. And then there's a uh, gamma of alpha, there's a constant, well, the lambda of the alpha and the gamma of alpha together are constant, so that um, the thing integrates to 1. But what is the gamma of alpha? This equals 1, if and only if. Let's see, I'm going to make a change of variables. u equals lambda t, du equals lambda dt. And lambda to the alpha minus 1, t to the alpha minus 1, therefore equals u to the alpha minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to take most of these lambdas, 
and put them together with the t, the alpha minus 1, to get my u to the alpha minus 1. The other lambda, I'm going to put in uh, with the dt here, okay, because I'm going to put this down in here, so there's going to be a dt, okay? Let's write it out first. Integral zero infinity, lambda to the alpha over gamma alpha t to the alpha minus one equal minus lambda t dt equals one. If and only if. Go ahead and make this substitution. So I'm taking my one of the lambdas and putting it with the dt here. Okay, and taking the rest of the out the lambdas and putting them with t to the alpha minus one to my t to the alpha minus one. So therefore, if only if one over gamma of alpha, which is a constant, integral u to the alpha minus one, u to the minus u dt still zero to infinity equals to one. So therefore, that gives you a definition of what gamma of alpha is, which is the constant to make it work. Now I see that gamma alpha is integral u to the alpha minus one e to the minus u du from zero to infinity. And most of you who have been in another math course and we've discussed the gamma function, you've seen this definition before. This is the definition of the gamma function as a, of a function of a real parameter, alpha greater than zero. Why is that? This, this makes sense. Uh, you know the exponential will uh, kill the power of u at infinity. And then at near u equal to zero, I have to worry about the power of u. I don't want to get anything negative one or less to the, to the power of u. But a fractional power between zero and one is okay. So alpha positive is all right here. Proper integral, but it converges as long as alpha is strictly positive. Okay. Alpha equals one half. You have to get a u to the minus one half. It's u to the minus one half. U to the minus u. U. That's that gives you a gamma of one half. The author actually tells you what the answer is, but we're actually derived it in example C, uh, in example C, page sixty-one. And actually derive what gamma of one half is by playing around. Okay. There you go. Page sixty one, the first thirty four. Okay. Did they actually derive what this number is? Square root of pi is what the advertised number is at some point. Okay. So, and, but, and if it's integer values, you actually know how to calculate gamma of alpha, right? Who knows what's gamma of pi? Uh, almost. It's four factorial. <laughs> you have to worry that the, the recursion is alpha gamma of alpha is gamma of alpha plus one. So it actually it's um, so what happens is that um, so five gamma of five equals gamma of six. Okay. So actually gamma of five is four factorial. And it works out that gamma of gamma of zero is bad, but gamma of one is one. Gamma of one is you put alpha equals one, you get just e to the minus u du. That's going to give you a one. And it goes e to the minus u du. And so by integration by parts, this follows by integration by parts. You get this recursion where you uh, let's see. So you can obtain that by uh, actually. Uh, Integrated the, the power instead of differentiating the power. Okay, you can go the other way. Start with a higher power and do it by differentiating as well. Do an integration by parts. So I won't go into that. So that actually gives you the, so that means one gamma, it gives you that one gamma of one is gamma of two. Right? So that means gamma of two is still just equal to one. Right? But then, but then you get 2 gamma of 2 is gamma of 3, so that means gamma of 3 is 2 times 1, right? and, then, and so on. Let's see how it works out. So the gamma of n is gamma, gamma of 
n is n minus 1 factorial, or n greater than or equal to 1. Gamma of 0 is back. Okay, gamma of 0 is in this. Okay. All right. So that's the gamma density of normalization. <laughs> okay. And you can see that it actually does, you know, this has the exponential density in it, so you could maybe go ahead and calculate the, the libel, I should be the hazard rate, libel rate, hazard rate for this one too, that would be a little exercise, but um, um, where it comes in is if you take sums of independent exponentials and the gamma is going to come out. So for the integer case, alpha equal to 2, alpha equal to 3, alpha equal to 2, uh, you get, uh, that's the density of the sum of two independent exponentials with parameter lambda. That's going to come out later in the next chapter, I believe. So I'll just leave it there. The only other thing the author says is that lambda is a scaling parameter and alpha is a shape parameter. Make it simple to change the scale, so x equals lambda capital T, right? Then the uh, then that's going to be um, gamma full of um, the scale parameter one. Okay, maybe that's not worse. Is that not worse? There's a little formula for how you transform densities. I could figure that out, but I was just showing you by using the little formula on page 62 for transforming the density, but I think I'm going to skip that, um, that formula, proposition D, page 62. There, be aware of it, though, that there is a formula for um, taking a density, and when you make a transformation of a variable, how the density transforms. It's not you have to bring in the chain rule. Um, I think I'm going to skip that now for the moment. Because I want to go on to join the distributor manager with chapter 3. Um, okay. Well, maybe you'll see it a little bit. Maybe you'll see that chain rule here. I'd love to do one last example so this will give it a little bit more light on the subject of proposition B. Um, Let's discuss the normal distribution and do one thing for the normal distribution. Of this. Well, maybe I could. Maybe I could. Maybe I'll just go ahead and apply proposition B here, make sure everybody can follow it. So let's go ahead and take this gamma density and, and look at the brand variable x equals times t. That's a pretty easy transformation, right? <laughs> okay. How would the density, what's the density of x now? So what's the capital F sub X of little x? Okay. <laughs> so this is a random variable that has this density, the gamma density. Capital T is a random variable that has the density of G of T. And now I make this definition, I transform just by multiplying by lambda. What's the density of capital X? According to proposition B, um, how does this work? Well, it's the previous density, g sub capital T, of T of x. T of x, okay, where I have to invert the relationship, right? Times what? Um, times dt dx. That's the uh, formula. The way 
this works out is really uh, easy, actually. Um, actually, I gave you a quick picture of it. Hopefully, this will help you to me memorize this formula. Um, what I have is I have, um, I've got my, uh, my, I'm thinking of my t axis here and my x axis here. So I've got my random variable and there's t values, right? That's what I started with. And so they're sitting here and supposedly I've simulated those with some kind of package, okay? If I wanted to. Alright, so that's my gamma values. So just a bunch of dots. And I sort of made them fit here to sort of simulate a, you know, a picture of a density, <laughs> okay? Picture of a density, you can imagine there, okay? And now, what I'm going to do is then I, then I transform this by this transformation and I get dots on the x-axis. So I just make the transformation whatever it is, okay? x of t, right? x of t, you know. And I, and I get a bunch of dots over there, okay? So what should the formula for the density be, okay? Density is probability after I multiply by the appropriate infinitesimal. Only after that. Okay, that's the key. That I have to say f of I have to say. So if I take so I take the dots here. Okay, what's going to happen is that when you sort of make this transformation, send, send the grains of sand through the hourglass, which is a transformation. Here's my transformation. Uh, call it whatever you want. I didn't give it a name here. Right, I just called x of t. T goes to x. Okay, so this is x equals x of t my transformation, right? Or going the other way, t equals t of x is the easiest form instead of bringing in some other weird Greek letter, okay? All right? So here's my hourglass. I'm going to send the grains through that and put them onto the x-axis, right? All right. So, but in that way, you think about of an infinitesimal interval here, it gets sent to an infinitesimal interval there, but it's not at the same width because of the slope of this hourglass, right? If this is, if this is a sort of a, a wide interval here, because the slope is near zero here, it gets sent to a skinny interval over here, right? But what's happening is the percentage of the, the probability, the percentage of, dot, of the total number of dots that were in this small interval is preserved. Okay, that's probability is preserved. I just have a million dots on both axes, okay? This hundred dots out of a million, okay, was whatever that comes out to be, one hundred and one percent or something, okay. One hundred out of a million, and that's the still one hundred out of the million dots over there. Okay, so the probability is preserved. So then I can take that into account by just a simple argument. So therefore, G, uh, this is location T, and this is location X. This, this is an infinitesimal interval, so I can call it T as a location. G of T times DT is equal to F of X times DX. That's the, those are the, what are equal, because those are the probabilities, okay? So therefore, f of x times the dx over there, okay, is equal to g of t times dt, all right? Therefore, f of x is g of t times dt dx. This is the slope of the inverse relationship. In other words, you have to bring in the slope of this curve, right? things worked out. So this is simply t of x is x over t, right? X, x over lambda, t of x, t of x is x over lambda. That's the inverse relationship here. That's trivial, right? x is lambda t, t is x over lambda, okay? So this comes out to be the g of t of x, which is lambda to the alpha over gamma of alpha. t of x is now x over lambda. Raising that to the alpha minus one, I get my e to the minus lambda t is now x over lambda. Okay. And then I have my dt dx, which is what's dt dx? Well, that's pretty easy. I take differentiate both sides of this with respect to x, and I get one over lambda. That's my dt dx. The slope is my inverse function is one over lambda. Okay. So this is a general formula. It comes out. I could have worked it out even more elementarily with this particular, you know, example of a transformation. Maybe what happens then? Well, look, the lambda to the 
Oh, the lambda is canceled here. Okay, and this cancels, and you simply get x to the alpha minus 1 u to the minus x over gamma of alpha. In other words, a gamma density with lambda equal to 1. So that's the proposition B after all. <laughs> okay. So you do transformation, uh, uh, univariate transformation. So probability is preserved. The way this works out, when you're taking uh, in higher dimensions, you take pair a random pair, and you transform to a random pair. Then you have a very similar thing going on, but you have a Jacobian place of the D, 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 X. Okay. You'll see that in the next session. Somewhere down the line. Okay. Okay, so there's a nice picture for that uh, proposition B, which he was not giving you. All right, that's it for chapter two, I believe, except for the normal density. What is the normal density? Notes three. I've been giving the notes three, and I've done the rest of notes two and a little bit more. <laughs> okay, so to finish the chapter two up. But I think it's better that you uh, this notes three goes into chapter three. Start with ends with chapter two and start with chapter three, and uh, you might get some hints about your next homework by reading that through to the end. Okay, so try to read it through, skim it, and bring your questions next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, normal density would be uh, f of x is e to the minus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared all over the square of 2 pi sigma. Okay. <laughs> uh, minus infinity less than x less than infinity. And the cumulative distribution function, usually this is called, well, I'll just call it little f of x. And, you, and the, um, and now the, the, the case is the case mu equal to zero and sigma equal to one is special, and then um, that gives you the um, so-called standard normal case. But I guess I'll write capital F of x, of course, is the cumulative distribution function is just the integral minus infinity to x of this f of t dt, so it's e to the minus t minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared over the square root of 2 pi sigma dt. Um, why is even that a density? Well, I'd have to check and see whether f of infinity is equal to 1 or not, right? It's capital F of infinity. Is that a density? How would you check to see whether that's a density? You've seen that all, you've all seen that in the first course, right? You would make a change of variables again. You would uh, make the exponent to be e to the minus z squared. So let's just take the case mu equal to zero and sigma equal to one. And it boils down, turns out, to that case. So I'm going to call it capital phi of x is the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal, which is minus infinity to, I'm going to call it z. Z, e to the minus z squared over 2 over the square root of 2 pi dz. Okay, so actually the fact that this is a density boils down to the fact that that's a density. I should put, it, I should put a, a, a substitution for it in here. I need to read u squared. <coughs> So if I integrate this minus infinity to infinity, that comes out to be 1. Um, that can eventually be boiled back probably to um, gamma of a half again. right? But then gamma of a half boils back to the fact that this is a density. So somehow somebody has to calculate gamma of a half. <laughs> and so actually it's a cheat in the example C page 61 that you get gamma of a half because you actually have to know this normalization for the, for the uh, density, for the standard normal density. So how do you get the square root of 
to buy. You better remember, remember that. That's a poor coordinates church. Here? Now let's see if there's an exercise for that. I think we're out of time, so I'm kind of fumbling here a little bit. Because I can only go push you so fast. Um, yeah, in problem 51, they give you the trick to how you prove that the square root of 2 pi is the right normalization here. Um, integral minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus u squared over 2, du equals the square root of 2 pi, shown in number 51. Check 2.51. Okay. I didn't assign that because many of you have seen it before. Um, that's this, this is the cumulative distribution function, CDF of standard normal, and that is tabulated in the back of the book. Tabulated for z greater than zero, which you will be using in this course too. Okay, not as much as you did in the last course at 381, for z greater than zero, and in appendix B. Appendix B, though, is labeled page A7. So, <laughs> so it's appendix page 7, okay, even though it's an appendix B. Okay, well, he didn't, he said not to go A1 through A4 and then B1 through B7. He just kept going on the appendices pages A's. So even though I don't know why I call it appendix B, but that's what he did. Okay? So that one is tabulated. And what the fact is, is that if I take this capital X, if X is n mu sigma squared, okay, which is the notation for normal with mean with this parameter mu here and this parameter sigma squared is shown in this density, then then capital Z equals X minus mu over sigma is uh, standard normal is n. 0, 1. Okay, standard normal, where the mu is 0 and the sigma squared is 1. How would, you, how would I do that by calculating? I could just calculate the density, right? Let's check that. Check. What I would do is calculate f sub z of little z. Let's go ahead and use this proposition b. That would simply be um, the f sub x at the x that instead of the z, so I'd have to put sigma z plus mu is how I invert that relationship. Right? This is the x equals sigma z plus mu. If I invert the relationship, z equals x minus mu over sigma. And then times dx dz. dx dz is sigma. Right? So this would come out to be that e to the minus junk, and I'm going to put sigma z plus mu in place of x, subtract the mu squared, divide by 2 sigma squared, then divide by the square root of 2 pi sigma. That's the definition of the density, f sub x. I'll put this f sub x. So he's using the capital X as a subscript to denote the density of the random variable capital X. So I'll use a capital Z as a subscript to denote the density of the different random variable. Otherwise, I have to keep changing the letter F all the time to a G or an H or something. So that's going to be the notation. So then times dx dz is sigma. Okay? So these sigmas cancel. All of this stuff cancels. And I do indeed get u to the minus z squared over 2 over the square root of 2 pi. So that verifies that the density is the right thing. It's the standard normal density. And therefore, z is indeed standard normal. Okay. So this is an application of proposition B then to verify this fact. There's many ways to verify it. Just make the change of their uh, change of variables in the in the distribution function method, whatever, but this was using proposition B. Alright, uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay, I guess we'll see you on Thursday. Try to read ahead. We'll, we're now out of this uh, review chapter two. We'll get into um, jointly distributed random variables.